All right. Good afternoon, Delaware, and welcome to Delaware Online and the News Journal. I'm Ed Forbes, Senior Director for Opinion Engagement for the USA Today Network's Atlantic Group. Uh, joining me this afternoon are Wilmington Mayor Mike Przicki. Uh Mayor Przicki is a Democrat who serves as the city's 56th mayor uh, since 2017 and started his second term earlier this year. Mayor, uh, welcome. We're really glad to have you on. Happy to be here, Ed. Great. And also with me is uh, Delaware Online staff writer, Amanda Fries. Amanda, welcome. John. Thanks for having me. You bet. So, Mayor, a couple weeks ago, two Sundays ago, we published an op-ed from you on the surge in gun violence uh, Wilmington and, and many other American cities uh, across the nation have experienced uh, amid the daunting challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, you wrote in terms of trying to solve uh, for surging gun violence. Rest assured that if there were a clear roadmap to follow, Wilmington, like cities across America, would be following it. The thing is, there is no roadmap. Crime is a symptom of weak social structures, poverty, and social isolation. These problems are deeply organic in nature." End quote. Uh, you went on to say and outline a strategy that will invest in the city's neighborhoods to create safer, healthier environments for residents, especially younger people. Um, can you start, as, as we get this conversation going, Mayor, by talking a little bit about how uh, that strategy plays out in your best hopes? Yeah, I think the way, uh, so I wrote probably later than I could have. I mean, this has been a problem that's been going on. And it, frankly, it's just my way that I just, I'm not very good at, I'm not very good at presenting some sort of strategic palliative. And I think that happens so often where where people have one program or another program that pretends to give people hope. But when you look behind the curtain, you know, they promise much more than they can deliver. And I think I think what's wrong with it is, in a sense, it gives people who propose it a pass. OK, I did my part. I, I, I funded this program and now I can relax because I've done my part for it. And that's just not ever going to work. And so. I, I wrote I wrote to try to be honest about something. And some people have said it sounded like I was giving up. Now I'm not giving up at all, but I, I have to tell you that the same old, same old that comes around every time we have a spike in violence, I refuse to subscribe to because I've been down this road before. I was chairman of the Hope Commission for 10 years of my life. We built that building. We did more for men coming out of prison than anybody else that I know around here. So I don't have to apologize for my record on this issue, but I do know that some things have proven to work to an extent, but most of the things we promised just never deliver. And so I don't like to see us put our eggs in those baskets. Uh, let me just think. I um, I think what I, if, if I have always had a, a, a sense of how we can fix this, it is that if we build our neighborhoods, we will also strengthen our neighbors. Uh, look, we have people, we have very low employment. Uh, we have we have very low income among, among people who are employed. We don't have a strong family structure, so we have women who maybe have two jobs or a job and three kids at home. And so, what happens? The children wind up getting raised by a 12 or 13 year old, or worse, they raise they raise themselves in the streets. And so, if that happens. Why is anybody surprised by the results? And so, you know, I think that the best thing we can all do is be is is be honest with one another, as painful as it can be sometimes. I just think that my contribution at my age, I'm I'm not kidding myself or anybody else. I'm going to tell you what I think, and uh, I don't I don't have to be blunt for the purpose of being blunt. I just think that a little honesty would go a long way in this discussion. Yeah, certainly very complicated issue, um, especially as uh, the community continues on, you know, this uh, now year long conversation about equity and police reform and, and racial justice. Uh, the, the violence, uh, the gun violence is, is just a sad backdrop against some some really positive things that are happening in the community in terms of conversations. Um, you know, we're a year out now from the death of George Floyd at the hands of police in Minneapolis and 
Um, we've published innumerable op-eds about um, everyone's efforts across the city and across the state this year to really try to bring the community together around uh, those those issues. Um, Mayor, before I let Amanda jump in, just tell us a little bit how you're feeling uh, about starting a second term as we emerge from a pandemic. Um, a lot of economic recovery in the road ahead. And so um, I'm just sort of wondering if you can give the viewers yeah. a, a, a forecast for post-pandemic Wilmington. Yeah, interesting. I'm starting to get a sense of what that looks like. I think uh, I made the point as, as uh, recently as a month or a month and a half ago that uh, that one thing we know is there's a new normal. We don't know what that is, but we have to adapt to some changing circumstances. Um, it's going to impact our our finances, so that's an issue we've got to deal with. So a good example is the new normal is that uh, working at home is now much more accepted than anybody would have imagined. Uh, that um, you know e-commerce, uh, distance learning. And of course, working on uh, it's all it's changing all of our life habits, and it also changes the way the city functions. So, we don't have as many people coming downtown, we don't have as many paying for parking. I know it sounds like a small item, but uh, we our parking revenue uh, three years ago was five million dollars. This year will be a million and a quarter. Hmm. But, and that, I mean, it's a, it's a big number in a 170 million dollar budget. All of a sudden, you're three and a half million dollars short. People working at home will leave us some number of millions short of our of our normal budget. So we've got to we've got to we've got to make up for that. On the other hand, on the and, and by the way, we still have, you know we're suffering from the economic woes where we're not we don't have employment coming to the city. We've got some good things, but our restaurants while they're open now are not back to pre-pandemic levels. And we just don't know what that we don't know where that where that level is going to wind up, you know, I, I think it'll be healthy, but it's certainly not going to be what it was if, you know, if experience is any indicator. I do think um, that the things that are working very well for us is we've got a lot of people moving in into the city, uh, that we have developers from in-state, or of course we have Buccini Poland making tremendous investments in the city, but we have out-of-state you know, developers coming here and they all want to build housing and rental housing in particular. So, you know, that's very encouraging for two reasons. One, it's really healthy that we get people moving into the city and, and patronizing our restaurants and our nightlife, et cetera. But they also pay wage tax. And so every time we lose an employee, an employee, we lose that wage tax. Every time somebody moves in from out of state, we offset that wage tax. So you know, I think that what's happening is the blow will not be as bad as as we were fearing, and that's my my hope. I I feel very good about people bouncing back. We feel people feel uh, optimistic and energetic, but you know, I'm a realist too. We have problems. Uh, we're we hurt over the over the violence that continues to uh, haunt us, although. Uh, bite my tongue because these things are better, better left not said. But we've, in in the recent month, we've really seen a a lull in the amount of uh, gun violence that we've had in the city. These are all kids. They're all 17 and 18 years old, with rare exception. Uh, they're 17, 18, 19 years old, and they're they have these beefs with one another, and they solve it in ways that the rest of us can't get our heads around. They don't. They don't have fights, and they don't yell at each other. They, they shoot at each other, and so you know. And I, so I think what happens when we talk about how I feel about the city, I feel I still believe we have the best police force around. I believe in my chief and his strategies. I think when the courts open up, and we can, we can get some of the kids who are repeat offenders into the system. Decide what, what to do with them when they're in there. By the way, which I think is. That's been a failure of government for some time. But we honestly have to take these kids off the streets because if no other reason for their own safety, uh, kids get shot and killed while they're out waiting to go to trial or when they're just coming out themselves. You know, you've got these leftover revenge that goes on. It's uh, it's irrational, but it's it's a reality. So I think, you know, I think, and to sum this up, that these kids grew up in really, really rough neighborhoods. They grew up in in uh, D 
dilapidated homes in environments that just say nothing good is happening here. That's not to say you don't have good people. We have plenty of good people in these neighborhoods who have survived this. But kids internalize their environment. You know, they internalize their environment all the time. And if you're in a place and your and your playground looks like hell and the house next to you has been boarded up for the last 20 years, as happens all over the city, by the way, I think you internalize that. And I think unless you've got unless you've got a strong support system, you're going to fall prey to that. And so my view is um, all we can do is rebuild neighborhoods. We, we were going to dedicate $5 million to this before this federal funding showed up. It looks like we're going to get a lot more money to be able to deploy and really create some, create some value in neighborhoods that have been deprived of value for a long time. So I think the, the essence of what I want to do is that I, I still have thoughts about education. I've got thoughts about policing, but they're, they're parallel issues. Appreciate that, Mayor. Uh, Amanda, we'll kick over to you. To kind of uh, piggyback on what you were, were talking about, Mayor, um, you mentioned that the city is getting additional funds from what you expected through the, res the American Rescue Plan that you hope to use for um, you know, improving neighborhoods. Do you have a, a final number as to how much will be devoted to that cause? So here's the uh, the wild card is this. So we have, uh, we've balanced our budget for two years. And uh, well, we've, we've, had a, we've had no tax increase for the, this is the fourth year coming up. And, um, but the last two years, because of the pandemic, we frankly used our fund balance to balance the budget, which leaves you with a structural deficit of about five or $6 million. So we've done that two years in a row because there was no appetite to lay people off in the pandemic, no appetite to raise taxes in the pandemic. Uh, so we put ourselves in a position where we're a little vulnerable uh, financially. We've got, we've got, we deferred, we deferred the problem, and now we got to deal with it. The trouble is, um, it's too complex to explain right now. But the only way I'll use that money for budget balancing is if it serves as a bridge to a place where we can uh, find a little bit of a safe harbor. We, we just have some expenses that are going to drop off in the next seven or eight years. And I think they would really help us balance the budget. But we have a little, we're vulnerable in about three or four years and maybe we can use it for that. But uh, we, we run a five, we run a five year budget uh, projection uh, weekly and uh, we, we're not satisfied with what we see yet, so we've just got to keep working on, on trimming expenses, which unfortunately means that we're cutting some staff and raising revenue, which in our case has got to be a tax increase of some sort. There's just no other way around it. And hopefully we can find that balance that's going to get us to that, to that place where we find some financial stability. So some of the criticism of recent development throughout the city is that it doesn't benefit the existing residents um, who, you know, are residing in Wilmington, for example. Um, I just think off the bat, the high rise apartments on the riverfront, I, I can't afford it. Um, so I imagine there's plenty of Wilmingtonians who cannot either. What are some of the uh, currently underway uh, developments that, that provides affordable housing and improved amenities that specifically are benefiting the residents already living in Wilmington? Sure. So it's, uh, I think it's legitimate. It's a legitimate point of view. It's, it's not adequately informed. So we, the city, have not invested a penny in any of the projects on the riverfront or in the downtown. They're all, it's all private development down there. So we wouldn't, we wouldn't keep somebody from developing in the downtown any more than we would keep them from developing in another part of the city. The, um, my vision for the, for the riverfront uh, is, as I've just described recently, is with some of the money that we have, we'd like to build some affordable housing on the river, so it becomes incorporated into the rest of the residential living that's down there. That, in fact, it becomes a little bit more affordable. We are, uh, you know, we're supporting. We have supported uh, the development of the flats over on the west side of town. We're supporting uh, Reach Riverside to a significant extent up in the northeast. I have ideas for building affordable housing uh, along the Brandywine, which has got its complications, but we'd like to do that. 
And then, frankly, uh, you know, I think this idea of rebuilding our neighborhoods incorporates incorporates demolishing old, worn out, vacants that pull a neighborhood down, uh, rehabilitating home ownership, home, homes that have been owned for, in some cases, 50 years by people who just can't afford to improve them. Uh, your, your roof leaks, I'm sorry, I can't afford $4,000 or 5000 for a new roof. So we want to make those funds available. We want to build new throughout that side of the city. And that, and so I think there, going to be, there will be housing choices for everybody over the next three years. Uh, I think our problem is, since we have a fair amount of money allocated for this, uh, our problem is going to be getting the capacity to, to build, meaning capacity is to some extent supplies and to a greater extent uh, the workforce to do this because it's going on everywhere. So, and the tragedy of the this, of the workforce today is the workforce was very healthy in 2008. And by 2010, when the world ended, everybody left the trades and didn't go back. They never went back. So all of a sudden we need the carpenters and plumbers and electricians and there's a shortage of all those trades. So our view is to uh, to go into our communities and train young people who are not currently uh, employed. Uh, we will. The concept is to let them spend some time in a classroom and then get on the job and learn on the job by people who are dedicated to training young people. And by the way, and pay them the whole time. We pay them well the entire time. So, so we do two things. We're paying individuals. We're bettering their lives. We're building product that we think is a, a really important to the city. And I think what we're doing is we're creating a norm. We're normalizing working in neighborhoods where there has not been uh, this kind of a um, kind of tempo to the day for some time, unfortunately. Are there any programs um, or you know instances of uh, you know working with local uh, minority-owned businesses to help with the development efforts and and uh, revitalization of neighborhoods? Yeah. Well, I don't know that there's any particular program uh, other than describe other than what I just talked about. We just met yesterday with a, uh, a very capable minority developer, talked about the entire program. He's all on. We met with, uh, we met with um, uh, the Votech school, our, our Votech high school here over at Howard, and want to talk to them about the training program. So we've got a lot of people with eyes on this trying to construct a program that works. The infrastructure and execution of these programs is tremendously difficult. I mean, it's not just like, let's do it. You got to find people who are capable and dedicated and willing to put in all the time it takes. Because in many cases, you're dealing with young men who've ne never really had much of a job and they don't have a whole lot of skills. And so you got to really train them up in a lot of ways. And frankly, you need people with a big heart to do that. You need people who are really dedicated to these young people. And that's that's what uh, I think we need. We also know that there are a lot of people who fit that fit that bill. So we're we're very enthusiastic about that. Um, I'm going to switch gears a little bit here. Um, we talked a little bit earlier about um, police reform and just uh, police community uh, interactions in Wilmington. And so I'm kind of curious when it comes to the city's community policing efforts and having beat cops who are walking the streets and interacting with residents. Um, we did a, a story back in 2017 that highlighted those efforts that Wilmington police were doing. I'm curious, you know, where those efforts stand, um, as I've heard from several residents who have remarked upon the lack of uh, police on the streets these days. Yeah, we hear it. We hear it a lot. Um, you know, it's it's hard to know what the truth is unless you're out there walking around all day yourself, and then you're in one block, and there's something else happening elsewhere. I know that when we we started, we had more police on the streets than had ever been in the city. Uh, my, uh, I remember the debate, the debate in the general assembly over giving money to the city. Uh, was stalled because nobody would would tell members of the General Assembly where the police were at any given time, where they were deployed. And in, in our case, I think people see police more than ever before. That's not the problem. Now, getting cops on the street, I think is, is uh, I think everybody realizes that's an important goal. 
I think pandemic probably created as much a problem for that as anything else. I mean, it had everybody, everybody kind of on edge about, about um, being out and visible and go, go, we never went to a single meeting, you know, in all this time, every meeting has been like this. Can't have a community meeting with on Zoom. I mean, it just, it just doesn't work. And so the officers started to lose connection that way. We still work with folks, but it's just been impeded, I think, by, by virtue of this pandemic. And I would say this too, and this seems, this seems kind of counterintuitive, but when, when the, the crime rate spiked here and across the country at the, uh, at the end of 19, I mean, it, it spiked. And you could see it in city after city. And of course, we were no exception. My, my guess is it probably, it probably, because we had, I, we had officers in one car. We didn't have two officers in the car. So now you've got one officer out walking by himself and you want him to get out and start walking around the street by himself. Probably, it's probably not a smart thing to do. You know, you've got a young man carrying a gun, trained, but still a young man or woman. And you say, go out there and walk the street by yourself. And my guess is, it, it, my guess is there is a reluctance to do that. So I think people look at it as the police don't want to do community policing anymore and nothing can be farther from the truth. It's just, I think the, um, I think the conditions on the ground were really um, were hostile to that to that objective. And uh, but I've heard it, I heard it, and I take it seriously. And so does the chief. And I think today, I think we can start to see things really open up and getting the community meetings and starting to be engaged with the public. So so people see us uh, out. And by the way, see me out too. You know, it's important for them to see the mayor. It's very important for them to see that he's walking around the neighborhood where. Mayors typically didn't go, and uh, and so I want to do that. But frankly, it's only been the last few weeks, and we're kind of like, getting out of uh, out of mask mandates. Do you anticipate that uh, there will be more police community interactions going forward now that uh, mask mandates have lifted, and you know further coronavirus restrictions are, are kind of being loosened? <clears throat> yeah, I would almost guarantee it. You know, I uh, I talk to the chief often, and I I think that. I think it's a high priority for the two of us. We don't like to hear this. We don't like to hear people say you can't see a cop when you need one. You know, we've had we've had shootings where the police were literally two blocks away in either direction. So they're out there, but you know, there are only so many police out there, so people don't always see them. And um, yeah, it's 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 a dicey uh, spot to be in in many cases. But I I'm confident that our officers are going to get out on the street and make an effort to engage once again with the public. You know, by the way, we just went through the winter too. So in the winter, no one's out. We're, there are no excuses anymore. I mean, I don't want to say there are excuses, but there are no reasons anymore not to be out there, not to be engaging with the public. And as I said, that goes for me too. Speaking of engaging with the public, um, and this is probably a little bit of a selfish question, but I imagine maybe um, uh, Wilm Wilmington residents also might feel this way is, uh, you know, being able to get information as well as have a conversation with folks in the police department. I know it's been a challenge to, you know, have a dialogue and, and get straight answers and, and information on potential shootings or criminal activity, as well as, you know, just providing enough detail to the public so that they're reassured that it's not going to impact them directly or, you know, that the, the police department is on top of things. I, I'm, I'm curious whether, uh, you know, there are any efforts to kind of uh, open, open up the dialogue uh, between the community and the police department. Uh, I think it's kind of the same answer as before. I think, the, I think the department, police departments tend to be, uh, I don't want to say secretive. They tend to guard their information because they're always afraid these things are going to uh, impede a, a uh, an investigation of co-defendants and other prospective defendants. So, I mean, I would say that that's probably the best the best reason for trying to understand that department uh, kind of protecting information. I would hope that we. <clears throat> I would hope that, that you know. John Rago, you know very well, and and I would kind of counter that 
to some extent, you know, if you if you got to complain about something, I think we're pretty accessible. But there are some things they say, look, we just can't give them that information because nobody's supposed to know about it. And I can't give you I can't give you a concrete example, Amanda. But you know, that's uh, that's the best answer I can give you right now. I hear it. I hear it. I hear it mostly from people in your profession. And you know, you've got your job, and they've got their job. And uh, and I think that I think that a good health attention is is good for everybody. But you just keep asking, you keep pressing, and they'll keep resisting, and we'll find we'll find the right place. Um, it, the the one other question I have, um, and don't want to bogart all of the time here, Ed. Uh, is uh, with regard to the city's point system that um, allows for the shuttering of a business if they have excessive criminal or code offenses. And I'm, I'm, I'm out of curiosity's sake, I know that you've improved the, uh, the housing code for the city and this has you know, really been a focus for the administration is in improving neighborhoods. So you know, how many businesses have been closed through this process? Um, <laughs> Uh, since you took office. Yeah, I, you know, if you prepared me for that, I could give you the number. Not a, not a lot, I don't think, probably fewer than I would, than I would like. I think we try to be pretty respectful of the Constitution, but there are times when we all lose patience with uh, the operators who just allow their places to be places where everybody congregate, and, you know, you stay, well, especially a liquor store, Everybody's drinking, you know, in one place and getting mischief. But some of the some of the corner stores are bad. I mean, some of the corner stores wind up in kind of congregating places, and then they do they do things that are patently illegal. You know, they they take goods from product from a store. Frankly, wind up paying people to go out and get the product. They sell them on their shelves, and when you know when our guys go in and see the, what they've got on their shelves, they realize. You didn't buy that from the wholesaler. Uh, you got that the wrong way. And so when they do that kind of stuff, they want to close because it's just that's just that's a cultural. That's like an attitude. You know that if you're cheating on this, you're going to be cheating on that, and you're not going to much care about the community that that you're serving or that's basically providing you an income. So uh, but, you know the law says the law says you can close them, but the law also says you can't close them forever. You got to you got to abide by the rules, and we do. But uh, let me just tell you, uh, just to give you an idea, in my first year, I'm sure it was my first year, we bought two liquor stores, and one of them was a terrible problem on 7th and Washington, and we purchased it. And so sometimes that's what you have to do. We don't have the ability to condemn real estate uh, for development purposes, or frankly, even for a purpose like that. The General Assembly took that away from us years ago. I thought it was a terrible mistake, but we have to live with the rules as we find them. So we have to do whatever we can to try to buy, buy up, or control these uh, these unruly store owners. All right, well, Amanda, do you have more? I was going to ask you if you want me to keep going. Yeah, go ahead and take another pass, and then I think we'll bring it home. All right. Um, the 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 other question I have here is with regard to the second phase of the riverfront development. Um, I'm curious when it comes to local minority owned businesses in the city, um, if there are any that are, you know, working in partnership with the second phase um, or, you know, if there are, if there are any efforts by your administration to partner with uh, area businesses uh, for those development efforts. You know, probably when you say area businesses, well, first of all, we, we meet with our MBEs constantly to try to, to do everything we can to support them. One of, the, uh, one of the pockets of the federal money for me is going to be uh, capital for minority business development. So we haven't figured out a number yet, but I promise you it'll be more than adequate because, because um Young people with good ideas and a lot of work usually fail because they just don't have that. They don't have that reserve, and uh, and they don't have a rich uncle to call for the reserve, or you know, don't have a family member, whatever. And so, access to capital is, is really important, and I think we can provide that. I will say that one of our challenges on our on our 
uh, allocation of business to minorities, and as re, as is covered in any disparity study we have, is we really find um, some of our projects are so big that there's a lack of capacity on the time on the part of our minority community to take care of some of these things. I mean, we have twenty million dollar projects in our sewer in our sewer plant. Well, it's just a it's a very small number of firms that can do that kind of work. But notwithstanding that, we think we can we can continue to direct business toward our minority community. We can provide funding to keep them well capitalized. We can provide trading for their prospects, prospective employees. I think this is uh, this is a once in a lifetime chance for us to really transform uh, the the uh, financial ecosystem of our community. Thank you, Mayor. All right. Well, Mayor, um, before we let you go, I just wanted to ask, you know, after this this project, which obviously is a huge, uh, will be a huge undertaking and, and has got, a, you know, a lot of complex elements that we'll be paying close attention to, you know, what what is next on the horizon uh, for you in terms of where you want Wilmington to go? You know, I think it's funny about uh, people have interesting perspectives on Wilmington. So, I would tell you that if you compare Wilmington to, to cities that are kind of cut from the same general cloth, so Trenton, Camden, uh, Richmond, although Richmond's a little bit larger, you see all these cities, we stack up so well in so many ways. We have so many aspects. We have poverty that we have not dealt with for decades and decades. And shame on all of us, because nobody dealt with that. And um, and so we, I think we have we have su the city has such good bones. It's got so much going for it that while we have to dig out of a hole in in some parts of our community, and we've got to build up the trust among members of our community, we still have all this good stuff to build on, and other cities don't have it. So that's the thing that keeps me optimistic. I believe I believe that if we can if we can just start lighting the fire. Uh, in our neighborhoods, in our schools, confronting some of our problems honestly, which, as I said, people tend not to do. If we start doing that, I think we have so much to build on. I feel very optimistic about our future, and I, I, that's just how I feel about it. Well, if, and if there's a next frontier, Ed, I um, mean, I just had a thought. If there's a next frontier to all of this, it should be an, it should be an education, and we ought to deal with our school system today. We ought to take the blinders off, try to understand what is happening. By the way, we ought to stop blaming teachers. It is a tough job. These kids come from terrible poverty. Uh, we have to start dealing with them much earlier so they come to school prepared to learn. And that's that's a big that's a big project, and it's one we've got to be willing to take on. Well, that that's that gives us good fodder for a future conversation, Mayor. Uh, we appreciate your time this afternoon and. Hope that we can do this again, uh, perhaps in person, uh, before too long here uh, as the summer winds on. Uh, a quick note to our viewers, if you want to contribute to the conversation, uh, visit DelawareOnline.com slash opinion, and you'll find ways to contribute uh, op-ed pieces and letters to the editor, which we are glad to uh, consider. And of course, as ever, we invite you to subscribe. We have a Memorial Day sale going on now, and uh, hope that you will continue to support local journalism. So. Uh, Mayor Przicki, thanks for your time. Amanda, thank you. And we will sign off. Take care, Delaware. Bye-bye.